Hi, I'm Victor, and this is part of my independent study project. I watched four different documentary films recently, films that were influential or pioneering in some way on the American cultural landscape. Each of these films excelled at storytelling, and I was struck by the similarities between these documentary films and narrative films. So, I tried to identify some elements of storytelling in these films that I thought lent a lot of emotional power and drama to the story. These were common techniques that I saw in many documentaries, but I thought each of the films that I watched exemplified the use of them. They are number one, the testimony, number two, the characterization, number three, the everyday shot, number four, the primary source, number five, the dramatic reenactment, and number six, the dramatic reveal. In October, my brother and I left Ohio. We were driving to California. We got into Dallas on a Thursday night. Friday morning, while I'm eating eggs and drinking coffee, I get a good job. I mean, it's, you know, all these people are supposedly out of work. I'm not in town a half a day, and I've got a job. It just, everything clicked. It's as if I was meant to be here. In The Thin Blue Line, a true crime drama from 1988, Randall Adams is a convicted murderer on death row. The film opens almost immediately with his testimony. He stands tall, center frame, as he recounts the events that led up to his conviction. As director Errol Morris builds an increasingly stronger case for Adams' innocence, we see more and more interviews like this, but with police officers, judges, and lawyers. Each interview in the Thin Blue Line is unique, in that it portrays a character in the story, not a talking head, not an eyewitness. As the film progresses, we see more and more evidence that these people, the ones being interviewed, are complicit themselves in the central conflict of the story. Ultimately, Morris builds a strong case in the way a detective would with these interviews, matching up testimonies with dates and timelines and court proceedings. When we started putting the facts together on how much information we actually had, on the leads that we had to find out what we had, we found out we didn't have anything. And it's effective. By the end of the film, there is no doubt to the viewer about Adam's innocence. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, gentlemen. Another strong opening sequence appears in the 2014 documentary The Overnighters, which follows the efforts of Pastor Jay Ranke to house and support dozens of young men who are workers that flocked to his town in South Dakota after an oil boom. The opening sequence shows Pastor Ranke helping out the men by finding jobs, singing hymns, and waking them up in the morning. Like the testimony, this characterization sequence effectively conveys the premise of the situation. He is a pastor housing and helping young men, as well as characterizing the pastor as dedicated and kind-hearted. I believe that Williston needs to take a step that says the people arriving on our doorstep are gifts to us. And though there is a burden in receiving them as a gift, to welcome them. Hoop Dreams, a sports documentary film from 1994, is focused not on basketball, but on the lives and families of two basketball players from the south side of Chicago, Arthur Agee and William Gates. They're young, underprivileged high schoolers who are fighting for a shot at a life beyond the projects, scholarships, and contracts but to give meaning to each of the players' lives beyond their basketball games and records, the filmmakers follow them around in everyday life. As they walk to school, as Arthur's father goes to jail on drug charges, and as he comes back as a changed man. Here we see Arthur's mom graduating from nursing school. We're with William as he talks with his newborn sister. I'm like that thing, like the girl was born every day. That's what I'm trying to get. That shit just, that time of the year too, state tournament. To follow the two athletes throughout their lives like this creates a feeling of intimacy, investing the audience in the lives of Arthur and William. He was found face upwards with his eyes wide open and the policeman who found him said that um, he had wrapped him in a blanket rather than a plastic bag. Sometimes, the filmmaker needs to convey important information about the character or the story that they were unable to film. This could be an event that happened in the past, a confidential meeting, or an outside reaction to the character's actions. 
Here, in the 2008 true crime human interest film, Dear Zachary, the director, Kurt Ken, uses old home movie footage to show us what the victim, Andrew Bagby, sounded like. I'm Kurt Kenny and I play Indiana Jones. He appeared in every movie I made growing up. We made a movie! He loved playing bad guys. Shut up! Jeff, it's cocaine. Hey, huh? You must be a smart boy. Probably kind of a cool release for a kid who made Eagle Scout by age 15. Best Man's a little bit of a poor title for these things. I mean, the best man's really the groom. As a lifelong friend of Bagby, Ken began making the film after Bagby's murder, and he needed some way to show who Bagby was beyond the interviews with friends and family. He also uses several montages of dates and newspaper clippings, old pictures of the murderer, and fo phone calls recorded between the murderer and Bagby's family. If there's no primary source available and no way to film the necessary action, or simply a need to reconstruct events in a more coherent manner, the dramatic reenactment can hold a lot of power. He left, he came back in 10 minutes and threw a pistol on the table. Asked me to look at it, which I did, I looked. He asked me to pick it up. I told him no, I wouldn't do that. He threatened me. Again, I told him, no. He pulled his service revolver on me. We looked at each other for, to me, it seemed hours. I do not like looking down the barrel of a pistol. I do not like being threatened. When he finally saw that he would either have to kill me or forget the signature, I guess he forgot the signature because he put his pistol up. He took the pistol on the table, put it up, and stormed out. The Thin Blue Line was one of the first films to use a reenactment effectively. Here we see, this, see the same scene iterated several times as witnesses recount details and as the story progresses, advancing the idea of faulty memories and providing the viewers with a concrete model of the events as they unfolded. If you're the investigator assigned to the murderer and you, you, you get frustrated with other witnesses, but when you got a police officer that witnessed it, you expect that they would know a little more than she knew. Procedure when it's a two-person unit, either one approaches the car, the other positions itself to the right rear where they can watch all the activity in the car. And if, if the man on the left or the driver gets in trouble, well, the partner will be in Speculation was at the time that his partner was sitting in the car. When used effectively, the dramatic reenactment can add action and entertainment while advancing a particular view of the events. Like narrative films, documentary films often reach a dramatic peak in their story, the turning point towards the resolution. This is represented by a crucial sequence or conversation, a big reveal. One excellent example of the big reveal is shown in The Overnighters. The very first scene of the film it hints at this revelation, as the pastor sits in a field at sunrise and reminisces about his public reputation as a pastor. And the private person begins something else. And the result is always pain. That way, the shocking moment when Ranky reveals his disloyalty to his wife does not come as a total surprise. So yesterday I went for a drive, looking for a place where you and I could sit and talk, where it has no positive memories, where it's ugly, so we could have the conversation and then leave. I have to make confession. Terry Forky is going to come probably in a week or two and ask me if certain allegations are true. 
and they are. Who? There's a man who's blackmailed me. And But still, it's immediately clear that this is an earth shattering revelation. And it points to the greatest success of the filmmaker, Jesse Moss. His ability to get close enough to his subjects so that they share intimate conflicts such as these with his viewers. I have served my own will. I have led others into temptation. I have sinned against the members of this entire community to whom I have spoken publicly as a servant of truth. I have now tempted this community to doubt that truth and to regard the testimony of God's word and the ministry of this congregation as a lie. Here's an interview that Moss did with DP30. For me it was possible. Um, and that I found somebody who was willing to open his life up and allow me in and this really turbulent, dramatic point in his life. Good documentary films have the power to change lives and make true stories compelling and exciting. But no matter how you tell the story, it's important to realize that the impact that any documentary has is made by creating a relationship between the subject and its viewer. This makes great documentary films especially powerful as we begin to value connections like these more and more.